Hey there, welcome to the Snakebird Podcast. My name's Josh. And I'm Steve. Together we invite you to join us as we explore the mysteries of Scripture, the realm of God, and freedom through Christ. So spread out those wings. And slither in place. Because this is Snakebird. Hey, welcome Snakebirds to another fresh off the presses episode of the cast. Today we're taking on the topic of money, or more specifically tithing and how it relates to us, fiscal responsibility within churches, pretty much finances in general, and how we as snakebirds should approach and view this important issue. That's right, guys. It's awesome to be here with you today in this wonderful season of taxes. And we thought, what better (laughs) time to discuss money than right now? And though money sermons are not the best received, we thought we would discuss the very topic for two reasons. Number one, this isn't a sermon. And two, this topic has evolved quite a bit from Jesus' time until now. Obviously, money's always been a topic, but many things have changed too. And we know that there's a whole lot of skepticism out there directed towards shady churches taking money. Uh, mismanagement of money. So we thought it was definitely worthy of a snakebird topic. Yeah. When you start talking about money around Christians, it's, you know, usually you start pulling on your collar a little bit because yeah. it's a touchy topic. It really is. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of thoughts that surround mm-hmm. it. We will definitely say that. Yeah. And you know what we're talking about, listener. Everyone has a um, differing opinion, a, a, an opinion on this. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah, we've got snake and bird on this. Yeah. The, the most common question I see is what does God need money for? Exactly. I hear it. I hear it all the time. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, something you have to look at through a a proper lens. (laughs) Exactly. Well, our our goal is to answer that question in this cast. Yeah, it is. It is. And, you know, one verse that I wanted to share at the beginning here is one that speaks to equality in giving, because some people aren't able to give as much financially due to barely being able to put food on the table. Mm. And God actually speaks to the equality of those who give, and it it has nothing to do with how much it is. So if that's, you know, something that you've always felt guilt for or something Mm -hmm. you can't give and you're sinning because you can't. Anyway, it's Exodus 30, 15. The rich shall not pay more and the poor shall not pay less than the half shekel when you give the contribution to the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. And I just really love finding that the other day. It was in my daily reading. Oh, yeah. And it, it's it's God making a statement of his heart towards all of his children. So um, it, it, it's an equality statement. Uh, God doesn't need our money. Hence yeah. the half shekel. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then one, one interesting thing I found as I looked that up, the half shekel, um, the current chief rabbi in Israel has put a modern value of $6.23 on the half shekel in preparation for the third temple. Oh, well, has nothing to do with the study, but I thought that was pretty cool. I thought <laughs> yeah. y'all might like to hear that. Oh, well, that is yeah. neat. So six dollars and twenty three cents. Yeah, you know anybody could probably muster that up. So don't for feel less bad. than the cost of a cup of coffee it's, yeah. from Starbucks, At really. Starbucks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> probably thinking you pay six twenty three for yeah, a cup of coffee. Yeah. I was just thinking of some of our listeners who have been with us for a little while and they're like, oh, oh, they finally got to money. Here's where their real heart gets revealed. And so hang with us. Hopefully you get to the end of this and you agree with our stances because we're trying to come directly from a biblical stance. Yeah. Snakebird needs money. (laughs) (laughs) Total joke. (laughs) Save that sound clip. Yeah. Oh man. So Josh, what should we touch first? I know this this is a there's a lot of things that we could go into with yeah. this. And there's I know Josh and I both talked about this before we aired and there's there's a lot of different um, angles we can come from it. And uh, where should we go first? I know that the big question, does the Bible tell us that we should give money to the church? I think that's where we have to start because there's okay. a lot to unpack even there. All right. So If we do, in fact, see that we as believers should be contributing to our our home church, our congregation, and um, we do see that in Scripture, (laughs) we're going to be getting to it. Yeah. Uh, But I think we should first define what the church is. Now, I'm pretty sure that many of you out there have heard the statement that we as the believers are the church. And for some, this is a truth that affects who and what work we give to. I've actually met several believers who have taken the stance of giving to where they have best researched in order to best serve the kingdom of God. And in quite a few cases, they give very little, if any, to their home congregation. They feel this sense of, well, this is my money. I'm going to be in charge of where I think the kingdom is best fit. And mm-hmm. um, I, I do want to get into that specific idea here in a moment, but I thought it'd be it'd be good if we first lay out the idea of our home congregation as an establishment that we should, in fact, be Supporting financially. Yes. What say you, Josh? Oh, yeah, I I totally agree. 
Yeah. So I have brought several scriptures that speak directly to that idea of, of giving to our home congregation. Uh, the first scripture that came to my mind was Acts 4.32. And the scene is where the very first stages of the church started, you know, they started to assimilate after Jesus ascended to heaven. I'll just read that scripture right here. Acts 4.32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. So that spoke to me because we see that a side effect of one who is saved is that of selflessness. Mm -hmm. Um, specifically in this scene, it's finances. Uh, people were considering what was theirs financially to be shared with the congregation of other believers. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because the natural thing coming about in them was was the Holy Spirit being a believer. That was a natural response to yeah. that. That's the one thing, the first verse that came to my mind. And then we have the scene that Jesus himself comments on in Mark 12, 41 through 44, where he commends the way that somebody is giving to the religious congregation. And in this scene, uh, it's where the widow gave in her poverty in contrast to the many others who were giving in their abundance. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we can get more into that scripture as we go if we need to. But the point is that Jesus considered giving to the church congregation. It, that was a righteous thing to do. Yeah. And we should remember that in that scene, the widow was giving to a corrupt religious system. Because, I mean, there was a lot of things. Jesus flipped the darn tables, you know. Yeah. So it, 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 he was speaking in that in that scene to her heart and how she was giving, not to the place. And we'll also get into that if you're wondering, mm -hmm. oh, you shouldn't give to a corrupt. No, you're right. <laughs> and we'll get into that. But Jesus was speaking to the heart of this woman. And so I found that I found that very um, that that was a trigger that can that that, that can trigger some people when, when you think about it in that respect. That's so, true. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, it's it's very clear in the New Testament and the Old that giving is not only something that w we should do to our church; it should be a natural thing of joy for us, that in something that we should do, not under compulsion. First Corinthians nine seven says, "Each one must do just as he's decided in his own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves." a cheerful giver. And so it, it is something that we see that we should be doing. Yeah. Uh, we should be contributing. And we, we're going to get into a few reasons of why we should give to our home church, the reasons that we do uh, modernly. Yeah. Well, I think of that verse. I mean, that is so clarifying on so many levels where it's like, if you are, are harboring any type of anger as mm -hmm. you're going, well, God just wants my money, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And you're doing it with any resentment in your heart. Yeah. Then it's not even worth putting it in the plate. Yeah. It is not worth pushing the donate now button online or whatever uh, means that you use to give these days. Yeah. It's and God would rather have you set that money on fire, yeah. you know, than give it to him because it's not going to do the intended purpose. You're not giving it by faith. You're not uh, acting with, again, that cheerful heart. Mm -hmm. And the version that I read this verse out of said, not grudgingly or of necessity through covetousness. Oh, and it's yeah. like, you know, don't give hoping that you're going to get something better even yeah. going, well, you know, because there's a lot of that teaching out there is that it's going to come back in, in a monetary form. That's true. And there actually are some scriptures that talk that there's a reason people believe that. And yeah. I, I'll mention them a little bit later. I don't spend a lot of time on yeah. that, but there's a reason people think that. Um, one thing you just said um, that, that made me think of when people in the Old Testament brought a sacrifice to God, he said, without blemish, you mm -hmm. know, he, he didn't want a deformed animal, something that was already a loss to you. Yeah. It, it, and that really speaks to the heart of the giver. It's something, it's almost like you're holding something back when you give a gift like that. Yeah. And it made me think of like Ananias and Sapphira. Oh, okay. Because I always, you know, that's a harsh, they died. Yeah. But they gave half because they were holding back. It's yeah. kind of that same concept. Well, what about Cain and Abel? That's a big one. You know, Cain kind of just was like, here you go. Exactly. And it wasn't his best necessarily. All of those speak to the heart. It, it needs to be a joyful giving, something you've decided in mm -hmm. your heart. It's yeah. not a holding back. Yeah. And again, if you're not happy about it, then yeah. it'd be better for you to spend it on something else. Yeah. Really. And, and, and like I said at the beginning, it, it's not about amounts. Mm -mm. It's about the heart. It is. Because, I mean, half shekel. 
Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. Which, okay, you just said that. I had another verse that talks about a third of a shekel. I'm going to read it real quick because I came across it in my devotional reading. It's Nehemiah chapter 10, and it says, And we made ordinances for ourselves to exact from ourselves yearly one third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. This will provide for the bread of the presence, the regular grain offerings and burnt offerings, and so on and so forth. But he says everybody's going to set aside one third of a shekel, which if we go by the math that you said half a shekel would be six dollars so a whole shekel would be 12 so a third would be four bucks okay according so. to the the current yes chief priest in yeah. israel <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. yeah. i like that. Uh, inflation yeah <laughs> yeah well i like that um that kind of leads into our next um well the next thing i had you might have more josh to go on but i i asked the next question should people be paid for doing ministry uh full-time or part-time um because the system now looks different than it did in the Old Testament. Yeah. You think about the offering for those priests and the animals to be sacrificed. Um, things look a little differently now. The only thing I would say before we move on is just yeah. one thing, is that when we tithe, and I think you clarified this, when we tithe, it's our way of showing God that we trust him with our lives and with our finances. It's not for his benefit, but for ours. Mm. And until we understand that, our view of tithing is going to be skewed. Yeah. So... Okay. Good point. Yeah, I just, you know, for the longest time, n not hearing it that directly to my heart, it was hard, you mm -hmm. know, because even my parents were like, here's your allowance. What are you going <laughs> to, you know, <laughs> what part is going into the plate? And I was like, none, <laughs> you know, because I didn't understand that. Yeah. And I was like, well, I understand that I got to give, you know, to that point it was 10%. And I was just mm -hmm. like... Well, that's messed up. You know, yeah. I, worked, I mowed a lot of lo yards or whatever for that. And I've got stuff I want to buy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These Nintendo games aren't going to get themselves. Come on. Yeah, and that's, man, that's why we're doing the podcast. Is yeah. Because, or this, this topic is because... Um, there's a lot of people that look at it in different ways, and, and sometimes they have a bad view of this. Well, just like the Christian walk, so many things without grace can turn into legalism. Okay. And it just turns into it so quickly because that's our human nature, and that's the fallen nature that we face. And so um, giving should never fall into legalism. And the moment that it does, it becomes sin. And yeah. it's worthless. It's It's that chaff that should blow away. So... I just, I feel like for me, this podcast is always reminding me of, of my stance on things. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's why I believe that. Tis the ballot snake bird seeks. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> hey, that's waxing poetic, brother. Oh man, just came off my tongue. So, nice. okay. Should people be paid for doing ministry, um, full-time or part-time? This is one of those questions that I think is most relevant for our episode because the root of this question comes from people's... Uh, distrust in how churches, at least in America, probably a lot of places, mm -hmm. uh, spend the tithe money. Uh, there are certain individuals who have become extraordinarily wealthy, and there are certain things that the tithe money has been spent on, whether by enriched individuals or the congregation as a whole, mm -hmm. that make many people with good reason distrust the church with our money. Yeah. Um, back when I was doing construction, I was building a fence for a church, and they just were real, hey, just put it over there. And this was an expensive fence. And, and we did it all. And then the board changed their mind the next day. And they said, hey, we, we want to move back over here. And I was like, this is expensive because all those materials are done. And they were just like, no big deal. Just just do it. We got we got the money. Oh, and wow. and it's, it's stuff like that that yeah. people hear about. And it's the misuse. And so I get, I get where people are coming from. Yeah. So let's get into it. All right, so I would like to wrap up this idea of the real reasons a church does, it does need money to thrive in the community, mm -hmm. missions, and then back to us personally. Yeah. Um, pastor, worship leaders, high capacity servants getting paid, is this biblical? And the answer is absolutely yes. First um, Timothy five seventeen through 18, uh, the elders who lead are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while it is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. 
So it's clearly acceptable and mentioned in Scripture that those in ministry are worthy of, of wages. And I have a few reasons why. Um, pastors and teachers, and Josh, I know that you can speak into this because you were one of these for many mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't think most people realize the time it takes to properly prepare for a teaching. Um even if that teaching only takes up an hour a week. A healthy preparation for teaching and preaching God's Word requires deep prayer, a dedicated searching through the pages of the Bible where you double-check, cross-reference um, the knowledge that you think you have with what God's Word actually says. Um, you, you have to sometimes dissect sentences by looking into the original language, the commentaries of other servants who spent their lives you know, studying God's Word. And then after all that, you have to figure out the best way to present the understanding in a way that's applicable and memorable to those who hear it. And let's face it, I mean, sometimes verses like Leviticus 19.27, do not cut the hair on the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. (laughs) A teacher of God's Word has to be able to give cultural context and modern application for why we read verses uh, that seem super weird to us now. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of of mental time and labor, and it's exhausting. And we shouldn't want our teachers and pastors to have to work a 40, 50-hour work week at a job and then tackle that kind of dedicated study. Yes. I think it's extremely appropriate that they be paid for that labor of love. Yeah, and you went into one aspect of the life of a pastor and the job description of a pastor, which is teaching, but they have so many other things because there's oftentimes congregants that are needing help, you know, parishioners, church people, (laughs) whatever you want to call them, uh, that need something during the week, whether it's counseling, whether it's appointments, whether it's, um, getting ready for, uh, facilities, uh, whether it's setting up things, whether it's, um, weddings and funerals, there is a lot of other things pulling on their schedules other than just preparing the message, which is what I would say the cornerstone of their, their work week. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's a lot of balls in the air to juggle at times that I've seen. Yeah. And there's, I know you have, you were, you were a pastor for many years and the worship leader. Yeah. And that's another one. Worship leaders, they they have a huge responsibility to lead the entire congregation into corporate worship. Mm -hmm. Um, In most cases, a worship leader has a lot more responsibility behind the scenes to make corporate worship logistically effective during service. Yeah. And they, too, are worthy of of wages. Mm Mm-hmm. So and that's that's one big reason um, that you, a lot of people look at that as like an hour a week you just get up there and talk. No, it's not. <laughs> no. It's really not. Because <laughs> if you do that, you're not going to say the right things. Yeah, and you're not going to have your uh, ammunition or your study done. It, I've mm-hmm. I've tried it like that. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> it did not go well. <laughs> yeah, I, I only dipped my toes in that water for about a year, and it's there's a lot that goes into. I mean, I was very blessed to do so. I don't yeah. need to speak of. Like. Yeah. And I wanted to mention that two of those quotes actually came from the Old Testament and then from Jesus. So uh, in that first Timothy scripture, it says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain was from Deuteronomy. And then the other uh, passage that says, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. That was Jesus uh, quoted from Luke chapter 10. Oh, yeah. And so as Paul's writing, he's like, Hey, I'm combining the old and the new yes. to, to let you guys know about this. Very good point, mm-hmm. because he's, he's wanting them to understand from the transition of Judaism into Christianity, you know, yeah, that's, yeah. that's good. Yeah, and I mean, I, I know a lot of bivocational pastors who have done it for many, many years because the church was too small to be able to afford to pay them, mm-hmm. and they did it with a, a glad heart, but you can tell at the end of the day, either they're tired or there is ministry opportunity slipping through the cracks because they just don't have the time and opportunity to meet the needs. Yeah. And so while it is one of the most challenging things in the world to be a full-time pastor or staff member at a church, it's also one of the most rewarding, especially when there's... Uh, when God is in it, you know, yeah. when you have defined responsibilities and you know what your calling is and what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Very good point. And just to wrap the whole idea for different things the church uses money for, I mean, we got to keep the lights on, water. Um, those are things that take money. Yes. And uh, for those who say, well, building isn't necessary for the church, um, are you offering your home? Yeah. I mean, don't offer your brother or sisters. Are you offering your home? Because there's a place that you need to gather together. Yeah. And um, 
if that's not the case, then maybe think about that for a moment. I know Francis Chan came out with a book, Letters to the Church, where he kind of has this idea of the church being more 20 people gatherings. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there is an eldership up top. It it almost sounded like a a Catholic setup, but (laughs) not really. I'm not saying that's what he was saying. But I understand the idea of some people are saying, well, let's let's just do those, like small groups as churches. Mm -hmm. Um, There's some disadvantages to that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I see the advantages for sure. Yeah, uh, there's more of an intimacy, but there's also there's also a very big place for a corporate gathering of mm-hmm. believers, um, because we're the body of Christ. We're we're needing to be together in a bigger way too. Yeah, and I think striking the balance is the difficult part because mm-hmm. you know I've been around people that have been like, oh, you sticks and bricks guys, you know, you all have to have the best facilities, and yeah, and a lot of times you do see mega churches that now seem to be a bit extravagant, where you're yeah. like, do you need that? Yeah, <laughs> you know, and which was one of the points Francis made in that uh-huh. book that I totally agreed with. Yes, yeah. So I get that. Yeah, but then you also. Um, don't have quite the opportunities like you were saying when you do the house churches and i know everybody's going to have a different style there was even a large 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 modern church uh where we live that decided to disband and start meeting in their homes but i think their effectiveness has clearly ebbed Mm. because i don't hear about them anymore and that's a little bit sad, yeah. you know, because I, I appreciate one of the models that I've seen where you have the church meeting in houses throughout the week in the form of small groups, but then you have the main building as the, let's get back together corporately and let's get on the same page and then go back and again, be doing, um, these house groups, kind of like the book of acts yeah, where it was like, they got together, they, they, um, were in the word. They, uh, you know, they spent time in fellowship and prayer and they, they had a meal together, whether it was a meal or the Lord's supper. Mm-hmm. Um, all those things were, um, what God had, uh, instructed them in. Yeah. Yeah. The last thing that I'm going to mention, um, is missions. You know, for some churches that are blessed with enough overflow and finances, um, there's mission work. Mm -hmm. Because we talked about, uh, the, you know, smaller churches, the pastor has to fulfill a lot of roles. He doesn't just preach. Like you said, there's counseling and all that. The bigger churches, sometimes people can be hired for that kind of stuff. And missions is one of those overflows in in finances where that's that's a huge blessing if you can do that. Now, I do want to say, for some, missions are simply around your own city. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't necessarily take money. Um, and that's, that is a mission field and yeah. that's, that's what, uh, we are supposed to do as Christians when we leave the church, that's part of missions. So I, I do want to say that, but this would also include, um, a call to go to other people groups, to go overseas, to spread mm-hmm. the gospel to other countries. Um, travel's expensive. Uh, the things needed in certain countries are major. Oftentimes, even with financial aid, uh, that churches offer missionaries, they're still, barely making ends meet with children, with their families there with them, and they do not live well. Mm -hmm. I know this uh, intimately because I come from a missionary family, and my dad grew up very, very poor in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, and they... They were sent there by the church, yes, but but they lived so poor. First thirteen years of his life, and it's it's very important that we give money to these these um, spiritual warriors spreading the these gospel warriors because they they're giving a lot up to mm-hmm. do that. And a lot of times people don't realize when they come back to the states, they haven't spent their time climbing the ladder of a career or anything like that. And most churches aren't able to. F- you know, financially support them when they get back. Mm -hmm. So they're just, they're back. You spent 40 years on the field and And now go to United and bag groceries. And so my goodness, guys, we've got to be supporting our missionaries Mm -hmm. if we have the means to do it. So that, that's another big one that I saw with, with money. Yeah. And the church that we're in right now, I love their mission statement that they have because it's across the street, across the globe, and into the next generation, seeing every single one of those as a mission field, Mm -hmm. whether it's local or whether it's global or whether it's in the the youth that are being raised up because they don't want to miss that generation that could fall away from the the faith. And so Mm -hmm. um, it's so neat to just have that mindset because I, I know of a pastor, I really appreciated his wisdom on this, where somebody said, 
I'm called to be a missionary overseas. And he goes, okay, that's a good thing. Now look at your life. Are you doing some of those same things now that you want to do over there? Very good thing. You know, and and you can't do all of it, but you can do some. And so, I mean, we'll talk about mission work, I'm sure, on some podcast but yeah, yeah. Um, I think those three things are so important and if you're in a church that doesn't have any of those um, it's not mission minded it's yeah. not uh, outreach minded then I would just either um, reconsider that church or pray that that's something that would be put on their hearts because that's what the gospel is all about Jesus gave us the great commission to go and not just sit in our four walls, but to yes. actually reach out beyond. And I'm glad you said that because on that note, I was I didn't have it in my notes, but I wanted to mention it in the in the episode. Um, this might be one of those areas. At the beginning of the episode, I mentioned some people research where the the kingdom of God is best served, and they, mm-hmm. that's where they put their money. This might be one of those areas. Missions. Mm-hmm. God might be calling you to research some missionaries to support outside, just giving it to your church, and then your church gives it to them. Yeah, that is an area that you mm-hmm. could do that. There's nothing wrong with that, um, because some churches, if they're not. Um, outreach minded in the sense of sending a missionary to another country that might be for a reason God's called them to focus on another area mm-hmm. but if it's on your heart that's a different story yeah. so you can you can pursue that too this doesn't when we're talking about giving to the church this doesn't mean you have to always give all of your what God's put on your heart directly to that church and then they mm-hmm. disperse it although a good majority probably should be that's some discernment area yeah. that you're going to have to pray through yeah but um and we'll get into a little bit of that here in a minute i think yeah but, uh, I, I thought i'd mention that well it's about obedience and it's really about just understanding you yeah. know i mean a lot of times when we look at charitable giving uh even for like research like disease research we don't want to give to something where all the costs are going to administrative costs yeah you yeah, know true and uh there's a lot of people that are turned off by those types of organizations well i'd be turned off by a type of organization where if i was giving to a mission field I saw that 90% of it was going to the administration, yeah. I'd be devastated. I'd be really down because I'd be like, no, the people out that are doing the actual boots on the ground work mm-hmm. need this. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and that's a that's a, a sticky situation where you might be in a church that's preaching the, the gospel good, but they just don't know how to finance yeah. well. <laughs> yeah. Or they and, overfinance in certain areas. Yeah. Maybe not in a spirit of wasting. They just, no. they're not good with money, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's something you'll have to pray through. Exactly. So, that, that would lead us to what probably will tug on many heartstrings out there because this is something this one of the reasons we're doing this episode legitimate concerns about giving to your Mm -hmm. church Um, while it's definitely stated in scripture that we should give to our home church there is a flip side to that coin that has bothered me and i know many others and that would be the reason that we should question giving to certain churches or individuals Mm -hmm. Um, example over the years, I've heard many brothers and sisters um, and teachers use this example of giving. And it's it's this scene where two brothers are walking, and or sisters, whatever, and you see like a homeless person. One of them gives them some money, and the other one asks them, why did you do that? They're just going to go buy drugs. And they say, it's my, it's my job to just give. God takes it from there. Mm-hmm. I hope I'm not stepping on anyone's toes with this. But to be honest here, that example has always bothered me. Mm-hmm. And I hear it I hear it a lot. I've heard it a lot. And before I go any further, I am well aware that in certain cases, this is a great way to exercise childlike faith because we should never be in the mindset of micromanaging what God does with financial seeds that we give in His name. Mm-hmm. Scripture definitely speaks to that very thing in verses like Hebrews 13, 16. Do not neglect to do good and to share uh, what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Proverbs 22, 9, whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed for he shares his bread with the poor. Mm-hmm. Um, so please don't misunderstand me on that because I do recognize that that mindset to be appropriate in certain cases. But there is another way that we should also look at giving to, and that would be the idea of exercising discernment in regard to how you invest your money. Uh, In Luke 16, we see a parable where Jesus tells about a shrewd manager of money. And this is what Jesus says in regard to that in verse 10 and 11. 
Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And we should also remember the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, 14 through 30, which speaks of a master who left his servants in charge of his finances. He commanded, you know, to invest wisely while he was gone. And this parable might also speak of, of gifts that we use for God, but one of those gifts is our money. And that was the center of the parable. And the point of the parable was to invest what your master gave you wisely. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that does mean that you feel the Spirit urging you in particular situations to give a homeless person some cash. And in those circumstances, you should go for it. But what we should never do is just blindly give our money to any and every situation that might seek it. Uh, in the spirit of, it's just my job to give. God mm. will take it from here. Um, we have far too many establishments that have taken advantage of very faith-driven people by simply learning a few heart-tugging you know, Christianese terms, and it urges them to give. So in light of that, I came up, I, I have a list of, of questions to ask ourselves to help anyone out there who might have trouble um, spotting an establishment or an individual who might fall into this category of unwise investments, spiritually speaking. Mm -hmm. Josh, I know you probably have some stuff too, things that w might trigger that I in you. Oh yeah, that was well said, and I, I can't wait to hear this list. <laughs> it's not uh, super long, but okay. I've got some stuff that, that I see. Well, and I think for me, I have a list of objections that we hear when we talk about people that don't want to tithe or that are hesitant to tithe because these come up a lot. Um, one of the most common ones is all churches ever want is my money. Yeah. You know, you walk into a church and it just seems like the first thing that you see is that basket, you know, mm -hmm. or the, the pass the plate. Yeah. Um, funny story. When I was in Africa on a mission trip, we went to a few different churches. We were trying to help some of the pastors there. And we literally went to a church where they have baskets on poles and they extend that out during the, um, giving time. And when they landed on a few of the Americans, they held the pole in front of us. Oh, well. Until we gave something. <laughs> oh, no, it, didn't, yeah. it didn't go away. <laughs> no, the basket just stood there. And wow. it was just like, and I mean, I was I was searching my pockets for some loose quacha, you know, just <laughs> like, okay, okay. Well, I didn't not want to give. I wanted to give. I just didn't expect to be compelled at that point. Yeah. And so I feel like a lot of people see churches um, just like I saw that with the basket being held in front of me. And... Um, you know, another objection is if I don't give, they'll make me feel guilty. Yeah. You know, I'll feel guilty. And it, I, I've, I, man, I remember a church where the pastor said, everybody now stand up. And he goes, take out your wallet. And he says, any money that you have in there, take that money out and hold it up in the air. And he said, now any money that you don't want to give to God, you put back in your wallet. And I mean, talk about wow. manipulation. Yeah. People were just looking around like, okay, well, I guess we're going to give, you know, because... What do you do with that? Yeah, exactly. You don't want to be the one person that starts putting your money back in your wallet. And I know there's some out there that would be like, heck yes, I'm going to put the money back in my wallet and I'm going to look around and yeah. make, you know, make direct eye contact <laughs> while I do it. But in that situation, it felt so awkward. Um, another common objection we hear is, well, they're just going to use it for the wrong things, yeah. like what you were just addressing. Um, you know, so that's really, those are difficult. Yeah. You know, because I would say this, if you're at a church where all they ever do is talk about money, you might be in the wrong church. Yes. I'd also say conversely that if you're at a church where they never talk about money, that's not healthy either. Yeah. So... That, that's a good point. And those are questions I think that we've all had. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, Josh, are you are you cool if I give a few of the reasons that, that we might question giving some red flags? Sure, you, yeah. Okay. So, some questions to ask yourself if you are having these, these thoughts of something doesn't feel right. Maybe I shouldn't be giving to this church. And maybe that's not suggesting that you leave that church. But no. here's some questions to ask. Number one is, what does this church or individual teach? Because um, this could be an individual you're hearing over radio waves or whatever. This is a big one because the two most important things that, w that should be coming out of a ministry is, number one, that the gospel is being preached and responded to accordingly, 
And number two is the building up of the saints who attend that ministry. Anything else that comes from a church after that will be a natural overflow from those two things. So um, community building, fundraising, outreach, all of those good things are fine and dandy if they are founded on the gospel and the healthy growth of the believers within that church. Mm -hmm. So that's one question to ask yourself. What does this church or individual teach? And then another question to ask is, what does this ministry look and feel like? This one can be a little more tricky because, for one, feelings and appearances can be deceiving. And two, there is a lot of approaches that have been taken by churches in order to be multicultural, multigenerational, mm -hmm. to get the message out there. Sometimes things have to be presented in a way for the message to be heard. Um, but something to be on the lookout for is a ministry that thrives on the science of community building. Now, hear me out, because I know that the church is a community, but, but listen to the mission statement from this national religious establishment, the Austin, Texas location of this church. We strive to act with compassion and to support the Austin community as a whole. Each year, we come together to celebrate, make new friends, and to organize for various charity efforts. We welcome anyone to take part in our community events and find out more about us. And then listen to, to this from a Florida branch of the same church. This Florida branch is involved in a routine sock drive for the homeless community in their area, and the local news station reported the following. As well as clothes donations for the homeless, the organization also campaigns against corporal punishment in schools, which is still legal in some U.S. states, and recently installed a billboard in Texas calling on students to never be hit in school again. The church also stands in public opposition of hate groups and are advocates for equal rights across the board especially on the women's rights fronts. And then here's a few tenets that this church is founded on. One should strive to act with compassion and empathy towards all creatures in accordance with reason. People are fallible. If one makes a mistake, one should do one's best to rectify it and resolve any harm that might have been caused. The struggle for justice is an ongoing and necessary pursuit that should prevail over laws and institutions. And then they say, every tenet is a guiding principle designed to inspire nobility in action and thought. The spirit of compassion, wisdom, and justice should always prevail over the written or spoken word. So here's the question. Do you know the church I'm referring to, Josh? I don't. Do, do, do. Come on now. <laughs> this is the church of the Satanic Temple. Oh. And as I read through various statements and tenets of this church, of the Satanic Temple, I was amazed at how close the language and terminology mirrored the mission statements of so many churches out there. Mm -hmm. Community building. It's this pretty package that is meant to do that to people. Mm -hmm. And the reason I bring all this up is because the church that Almighty God put into place is not to be founded on social justice, building local communities, or legislative efforts. The church that Jesus spoke of, the church that the gates of hell would not prevail against, is founded on the gift of the cross, which cleanses all who believe from their sins. And it is on that founding point where we will see the rest of the mission statement play out in its purest form. So when you hear mission statements that sound just like the satanic temple philosophy, you should at least do some research into what you're supporting. Mm -hmm. Because they can package it so perfectly, so pretty, all this stuff but it can be garbage. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know that went dark, but man, is that not insightful? It's With, crazy. Yeah, I yeah. thought so. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that one other thing that you should look for in a church or an organization that you're going to be giving to is transparency. Yes. Transparency with how they use the funds, mm -hmm. you know, because some of the biggest detractors from giving and uh, there's obviously been a lot of abuse and mistreatment of funds over the years is embezzlement or theft or misappropriation. And, um, you know, and we have to in our hearts go, is this ministry really doing what God has called them to do? Uh, we were talking about a church and, mm -hmm. and I'm still on the fence of what I feel like they needed this for, but the pastor wanted to do a series about being anchored in the Lord. And he <laughs> asked the, I guess the tech team or whatever to put, um, I guess a little tube or, or I don't know, 
basically they put four inches of water on the stage for him to teach in and, and a flotation device yeah no way yeah and it was on electrical stuff and so they they apparently heavily lined it and and i mean it looked neat and i think it garnered a lot of attention yeah. but i'm like is that something that you should spend money on and and mm-hmm. of course he has to be the one to answer for yeah. that of before course. the lord and 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 i feel like with the response that I saw, it's probably not anything that was outside of what they could afford. It's just, you know, you really want transparency. You want to say, what is, what is where I'm giving going towards? And a church should be able to account for that. And if they can't, then you either need to ask that they can or Mm -hmm. pray that they can or find a church that can. And, you know, this is again, one of those, um, I would say, uh, disclaimer yeah. episodes where we say, don't, don't roll up on your church and be like, I'm out, you know, yes. yeah. but really just prayerfully walk through these things because you don't want to be involved in a ministry where there's a greedy pastor who's like embezzling and yeah. just lording over the people. First Timothy three, when it talks about the man who desires the position of an elder or a bishop or a pastor, one of the qualifications is not greedy for money. And I appreciate being from ministries where the pastor says, you know what, all I know is what comes in at the end of the week. I don't know who gives. I don't handle the money. I don't touch the finances. Um, You know, and I think there's a lot to be said about being blameless in that area Mm -hmm. where you're not having to be involved. And I realize that some churches are small and so they have to get, you know, they have to be the the pastor, the worship leader, the treasurer, the janitor, you know, there's so many of those, but there's also God gifted people. And sometimes in our fellowships, it's like, Hey, I'm a banker. And you're like, would you mind helping me in this? Exactly. Yeah. That's a good, you know, so I just, I feel like transparency is a huge thing. And, and if you can prove, you know, Hey, this is what the money's going towards, uh, you know, and it doesn't have to be, um, I wasn't raised Baptist and my wife was talking about having business meetings and everybody kind of voting on how they would spend their money. I, yeah, that sounds foreign to me, but to some, it's like, I grew up with that. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't sound foreign to you, No, but I still believe that every church is going to have to account for what dollars come in and how they spent them. And at the end of the day, the pastor is going to be the, the head of the spear of that. And, and there might be called into carpet, you know, going, uh, what did you do with what I gave you? Yeah. Of course, there. You know, the, you mentioned that was foreign to you. A lot of times, that's a board. The pastor isn't in control of that. Mm-hmm. They're not in control of it. Yeah. So he might not have to answer for the finances oh, if he yeah. doesn't have control yeah. over it. But, yeah. but no, that that makes sense. The people who are delegating the money will for sure. Yeah, it depends on the the system, the Presbyterius model or the Moses yeah. model. All those things. Oh yeah, yeah. For yeah. Sure. So that's that's a huge red flag. Yeah, transparency and money. Yeah, and I I want to say that if you're in a church where you're concerned about how the money is used, mm-hmm. so there's a few things that you should do. Um, I would say communicate or voice your concerns to those that would be in charge, whether it's a board of elders or whether it's the pastor, yep. but also in the meantime, don't gossip or slander. Yeah. Don't go behind their back and say, did you see what they did with that money? Yeah, that's true. Cause that's, that's sin. Yes. Um, and then once you've voiced those communications, once you've voiced those concerns, if they're going to change, then praise the Lord. Mm-hmm. If they're not going to change and you're not comfortable with it, then it's time to walk away. Yeah. And it's not time to like burn the house down on the way out, yeah. you know, because again, people are sinful and if they feel like they're accountable to God for what they're doing, mm-hmm. then they're going to walk in that. Yeah. But it's not your job to be their Holy Spirit necessarily. You voiced what you were supposed to do and you can leave knowing that you have a clear conscience in terms of bringing those things up. And I, I would, the only thing I would add to that, that portion would be, you know, it, don't just leave because your particular ministry didn't get funded yes, or something. Yeah. Um, cause God, some, you know, he put them in charge for a reason. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes we, we can, we can feel a certain way, uh, but make sure it's, it's something that you do think is sinful. What's the words unethical, illegal, or immoral. <laughs> yeah. You want to look for those things. <laughs> exactly. If, if any of that's happening, exactly. then, then you have the clear basis on why you should, deuce out yeah according to what steven says that's he always says, deuces <laughs> yeah that's that's a red flag transparency if it's not there yeah 
I did have two more that okay. I'll just touch on. Oh, I jumped quick. right in. Yeah, perfect. Um, I, I compared the mission statements a second oh, okay. ago, but but more more um, easy to spot, I would say, than that would be um, hired. Th- this is one thing that I would have concern over is hired worship teams. Now, l- let me just mention why I say it that way. There are some churches I've heard that will actually hire. Of professional musicians to bring in a certain demographic of people. Mm-hmm. It's all about that community building, make this church big mindset. And the, the musicians aren't even believers. Mm-hmm. That's a huge red flag. Very much so. Um, if, if the worship teams are centered around putting on a show to attract people, it's ungodly. Um, worship has one purpose, and it's directed towards God. And to be frank, anything else is a prostitution. Mm. It really is. So that's a huge red flag. And then the next one that, I, that I've seen is um, life coach sermons. Mm. Um, this is a tricky one because I've heard so many modern applications brought forth from you know to further the gospel. The, the, the pastor is just gifted in that way to bring in. Sometimes that can sound life coachy. So that this one is a little bit tricky, but if every sermon seems to be aimed on how you can shine brighter, everything is directed towards making you feel more inspired, uh, then that's a red flag that a false gospel might be being preached. Um, again, it's hard because the nature of the gospel is the truth that sets you free. Mm-hmm. It does do those things to you, but there's a difference in what the gospel does for you and what life coaching, inspirational speeches do for you. Yeah. So that's those are two red flags that, that I thought I'd bring to. That's where some snake bird discernment has to come into play. For sure. Because, man, there's... Sometimes it can it can look the same. Yeah. Well, and it what does it do with the gospel? Does it make you want to go out and preach it? Or does it make you want to dream bigger for your, you know, your dream board? Yeah, that, exactly. <laughs> your, your life portfolio. Yeah. You know, if I just imagine it, God's going to do it for me. Yeah. I, I, the, the visualize it. Visualize. Yes, visualize. <laughs> there you go. Very Middle Eastern. Yeah. But. Which... Um, I had another story kind of cracked me up. I had a friend when I was in California who was like, you guys are all the same. He'll never come to my church. And I was like, of course I'd come to your church. It's a church, you know, just yeah. tell me the day. So he said, hey, come this Sunday. And and it was more of a word of faith church, kind of the name it and claim it. Yeah. And uh, I said, okay, I'll come. So I showed up and he wasn't there. And it was it was like, oh man, bummer. Yeah. Like I can't believe he didn't show up. And so of course I was already there and I'm not gonna just creep out. Yeah. So I sat through it and after the worship, uh, the pastor gets up and he goes, Okay, we're gonna read our financial creed. And they had this saying that the church, I guess, repeated every Sunday, but it went something to this effect that we believe God is going to bless us financially this week through uh, they went through a myriad of things like raises, inheritances, found money, stock windfalls, etc. Yeah. And wow. Yeah, I was sitting there kind of floored because I was like, "Well, inherent inheritances mean that somebody close to you probably died." That's a, you know, that's a strange thing to say. It was very odd. And then um, I also noticed that <laughs> on my way into the church, they had the pastor's parking spot right by the front door, and he had a very, very expensive car. And I felt like that was another one of those um, indicators of going like, hey, if you follow our you know, system, then this can be you as well. Yeah. And it just it freaked me out because... To, to me, huge red flag. And I yeah. told the guy who had invited me, I was like, first of all, you didn't show up. <laughs> and, and second of all, here's the reason I don't actually go to a church quite like yours. Yeah. And we had a discussion and, you know, we kind of had to agree to disagree. Yeah. But I mean, it was one of those things. It was just... You made the effort. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. And, and And I know churches are out there like that, but I think as snake birds or Christians, whatever you want to say in the classification, we have to be wise because, again, I've been to churches where all they do want is your money yes. or all they teach on is tithing. You know, they, they say, come on and turn to Malachi, yeah. you know, and it's, will you rob God? And, you know, test me in this and see if I won't open the storehouses and, yep. you know, and that's one of those verses, but it's not necessarily biblical to expect financial reparations from your giving. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people, you, we read the verse about God loves a cheerful giver. The verse before that says, uh, 
I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Again, that scripture is oftentimes used financially, Mm -hmm. and I don't think it's necessarily meaning that. Not necessarily. You know, there are people that Mm -hmm. God does bless financially, um, but it's because he knows they're going to use it to further the kingdom, um, I believe, in a lot of cases. So yeah. I, I don't want to say that doesn't happen. Yeah. But I, I totally agree with you. That's not always the case. Yeah. So wrapping it back to tithing, I wanted to share this. Uh, I had some tithing statistics that I found. Yeah. Uh, according to tithe.ly, so I think it's just tithely, okay. but uh, according to that website, of the 247 million U.S. citizens who profess to be Christian, only 1.5 million tithe. Wow. That equates to less than 1%. Wow. And I, I was going into this talking about the 80-20 rule mm-hmm. where 20% are doing 80% of the work or 80% of the giving. Yeah. That's less. It's that's less way less. That. Yeah. Wow. 1%, less than 1%. The average American gives about 2% of their income to charity every year. And when you think about that, it's a sad realization that believers are below the average when it comes to giving. They're not even giving. Oh, wow. They're not even in that 2%. They're yeah. less than 1%. Uh, giving skews older. The majority who give to religious organizations are 65 or older, mm-hmm. which is 54% of givers. And then those that are under 40 are less likely to donate. Only 23% of those that are under 40 uh, uh-huh. tithe regularly. Wow. Those, uh, those are some, those numbers bother me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's sad. Because, you know, I know that we just went over a lot of reasons that you should have red flags not to give and all mm-hmm. this stuff. And I think a lot of people see that, and that's where the buck kind of stops. Yes. They're like, you know what? There's just so much corruption. I just forget that. Yeah. But but the truth of the matter is that we are needing to be giving mm-hmm. um, to God's work, not because God needs our money. No. But because, for one, it it's, does something to us with our relationship with God. Yeah. It costs us something, just yes. like it costs David something, just like it costs everyone in the Bible something to follow Jesus, count the cost. Yeah. And and I, I don't want to be a, taking everything out of context here, but it's, it's, it's all wrapped up in there. Well, it's steps of faith. It's growth. It it's showing that... You trust God to do more with, you know, if let's say that you give 10%, mm-hmm. it's, say, it's saying that I trust you to do more with my 90 than I can do with my 100. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and there's a, it also speaks, if that's the one area in your life that you don't want to surrender to God for any 1% or mm-hmm. 2%, whatever the numbers were, um, that you might look into that. Yeah. Well, and I thought, I thought of an illustration and I'm, you can take it only so far, but it's a guy who falls in love and he wants to wine and dine this girl. And, and of course, you know, he has a budget, but it's only to so much and he does everything. I mean, he stretches that budget to make sure that she has flowers. She goes out to dinner, you know, even if he's watching a movie in a drive-in and they're not even at the drive-in, but he's making it happen. Been there. And he, yeah, yeah. (laughs) And he stretched that budget. You know, the reason that he's done all that is because he's in love. Yeah. And I think to a degree, it's like, why, why would we not be, if we, if we trust the God of the universe for our salvation and our sanctification, why can we not trust him for our finances Yeah. and say, Hey, I, I give freely knowing that this is what you've uh, commanded in your word. And that I'm going to do it by faith, knowing that this is going for a reason mm-hmm. and you're asking me to step out in faith through my giving to grow in another aspect of my life. Well, I think you can take that example all the way to the bank because mm-hmm. that's a perfect example of if you're in love, you know, you're going to do that in the same. If you love God, it doesn't mean you give all your money to God. It means yes. that you're, you are doing these things like back at the beginning, Acts 2. It's a natural overflow of what's been done for you. It's a devotion. It is. Yeah. So that's a great, great example, I thought. Well, I, you know, I don't have a whole lot more. Um, the only other thing that I saw was um, different scriptures. I'm not going to go through them, but th- there's a lot that talks about giving amongst individuals. The whole Acts 2 thing, mm-hmm. the, you know, what's mine is yours. Um, and that just, you know, it, it speaks to, to look out for your brothers and sisters, too. The tithing, giving money to God, sometimes that involves uh, helping brothers and sisters out. Um, when they're in, you know, for whatever reason. So that's, that's just another thing that I saw as far as money goes. Yeah. 
So uh, don't don't hold it so tightly that that, that you turn your back on someone in need, uh, brothers and sisters especially. Yeah. So, okay, I wanted to kind of close up with this and I'll ask you a question and okay. I'm not going to set you up like the Church of Satan or anything, but... <laughs> I hope not. They sounded pretty good. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, how much should believers in the New Testament give? Is there a set percentage, a set amount? Well, I mean, I think we've mentioned it before, but a tithe means a tenth. It means a tenth. Um but uh, this is something that you're going to have to, you know, pray through. I yeah. think it's a case by case thing. Um, I think that's a great starting point. Is a tenth. Yeah, it is for me. Yeah, and, and you know, God kind of reveals to us through Romans 12 that He wants a hundred percent. Got a mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Continue. Okay. Well, I think it's pretty clear that we're supposed to give of our finances to the Lord. But more importantly, I believe it's beyond clear that we're supposed to give our lives to the Lord. Paul said it best in the book of Romans, chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Mm. And I remember a band that I loved in high school, kind of a Christian, like, indie rock band. It was like, get in the plate. That's what they said. Yeah. <laughs> You know, like blow the usher's mind by just like taking your whole body and just standing on the offering plate going, I'm giving it all, you know, and when it comes to that, you have to seek what God wants you to do yeah. because, you know, for some 10% is a great starting point, Yeah. but for others, 10% is beyond what they feel yes. comfortable doing. Yeah, totally. There's some people that would not be able to support their children if they gave for 10%. Yes. That's just the reality of their situation. Yeah. And so I think it is one of those things where you have to ask the Lord, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. And do it happily. And if it's not coming naturally and happily, um, I say naturally, it's not going to feel natural because you're like, I'm giving my money away. Yeah. You know, but well, sometimes if, it will. Yeah, it will. And I just, if it's not coming from that place of joy yes. and faith then um, ask the Lord, what should I do? Yeah. You know, and I feel like um, one of the things that I found was when you talk about, am I going to start tithing regularly? You want to first and foremost pray mm -hmm. and then discuss it with your spouse, of course. Oh, yeah. You know, what should we do? Where should we give it? You know, as our local f fellowship, does it have any red flags? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I just got this picture in my mind of like the husband finding in the ledger. He's like, where did this money go? <laughs> yeah. I gave it to Jesus. <laughs> I've, I've actually <laughs> heard it. What? I've heard of couples doing that. Yeah. And the husband going, what? Who is Jesus and what if he... you gave it to a baby? <laughs> is he... You know, he doesn't even know. <laughs> yeah. Is he fixing our car? <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. And, um, another, I guess, uh, pro tip would be to budget monthly, yeah. you know, and set aside that percentage of whatever you're giving, uh, ahead first. And so you say, okay, God, this is my first fruits. This is for you and whatever else falls into place. And, you know, there's been a lot of stories and they sound kind of cheesy, but it's like, I set aside the money that I was going to give to God and it didn't look like the ledger was all going to balance out. Yeah. And yet through God's provision, it does. Those, and, yeah. There's yeah, special circumstances yeah. where God does work that yes. way. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, that's another thing. And, I read something where somebody else said, and this plays into what you just mentioned. Also, if you have it to be able to do it, set aside a little bit extra that you can bless others with in the midst, in the midst. So if you see a brother who's down and out or a family who's in need, then you have that little bit extra to say, Hey, um, this is not going necessarily to the local church, but to a local, um, person in need. Yeah. And then, then, other thing is to just start, you know, like I said, it may not feel as natural at first or it might, but whatever it is, this is like a muscle yeah. and it's going to take some exercising and it's going to take, um, that part of just saying, I'm going to believe in you, God, for this. And I'm going to grow in this. Yeah. It, you know, just real quick, it just came to my head as you were talking about all that, the the more, I, I don't know if you'd call it miraculous side of things or whatever, but I, I remember one particular year that I, I really chose in my heart. I was like, you know what, I really, I, I'm indebted to God. I know I can never pay it back, but I want to donate in these areas. And I went uh, beyond um, what 
I typically told myself was appropriate. Mm-hmm. And I and I had different areas that I and God he did financially bless me that year and the next year a lot. Mm-hmm. And I remember and I I knew it didn't work that way. I give, he gives me more, you know. But I, I remember when that, that following year after I made those commitments and they came to fruition um, I, I remember that uh, that extra money that came to me. There was a sense of clinging to that money even harder whenever I got more. Mm-hmm. And and I went through a season where I didn't give near as much after he blessed me financially. Oh, yeah. And there's something about getting more that makes you want to cling more. Mm-hmm. And so I just think about that. There might be someone out there that needs to hear that. That has God blessed you a lot? Have you, have you, are you, do you not have to worry that much? You can eat out every night, all that kind of stuff. Think about what you could be donating to, to further God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. And, and let me tell you the, the joy when I was making less money, I had more joy when I was donating to what I decided Mm -hmm. than that when I was blessed more the following year. So that's just something that I learned from. uh, I I thought I might mention that. Well, you triggered two thoughts real cool, quick. Go for it, because I'm, um, I'm done, so okay. we're wrapping up here. Well, I remember my dad always saying, and he was a pastor, and he had a lot of joy, and he was the one that, um, even though I kind of begrudgingly mentioned my allowance earlier, <laughs> he was the one that set the example of giving for me early on, and I remember him saying a lot of times, you can never outgive God. Mm. And I saw that so evident in his life where whether it was financial or even it was just through acts of service, he was like, it's not necessarily always going to come back financially. And it didn't Mm -hmm. necessarily at the times, but he said, you can never outgive God because God is always going to respond in a way. And another thing about tithing is um, not only do churches need to be teaching about it well and need to be mentioning it in the proper context at the time that God leads them to, not every week necessarily. But another aspect of tithing is we are sending it on ahead where the Bible says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where the thieves can't reach it or the moth or the rust. And I feel like that's one of the things that we're doing when we invest in the work is that we're sending it on ahead. Yeah. Some people they like to think of investments and this is definitely one of those heavenly investments that's going to have a hundredfold return because that's what Jesus promises as he's talking to Peter. He's like, trust me, everyone that's doing good for my kingdom, they're going to receive it. They may not see it in this lifetime, but they will see it. And so, um, I guess for me, that's one of the things that I forget about and I need to kind of revisit at times is I'm sending this on ahead. This yeah. is this is all for God. It's an act of faith and it's an act of trust. And it's knowing that no matter what, he's going to provide, even if it's not that 10%, yeah. you know, as you just dip your toe in the water. Well, to, you know, to kind of wrap that up scripturally, that whole point you just made, Matthew six twenty one, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Mm. Very famous. Yeah. Uh, and First Timothy six seventeen, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So. Yeah, for real. When you said very good earlier, I was thinking you were doing a Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was doing the Donald. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very good. This verse is very good. It's the best verse ever. Definitely not made in China. My favorite book's the Bible. <laughs> it's oh, a yeah. Bible. What verse, Donald? <laughs> oh, mercy. Oh. Uh, we mean nothing by this type no, of stuff. No, not at all. Just being silly. Yeah. So that's our episode about ministry, money, and you. I hope that we uh, scratch the itches that you have in terms of uh, addressing it, especially during this taxing season. (laughs) Uh, So if we did miss anything, please reach out and let us know. And um, if you want to talk to us about finances, we're, we're game. Because I know each of us had pages and pages of notes that I don't even know if we scratched on. And so we just felt like wherever this conversation went, that was what God was having us to say. Yeah. That, that's money, snake birds. And, uh, <laughs> I felt like you know, Jim Cramer there throwing the money, mad money uh, okay. at you. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's. Uh, if y'all have a question, guys, reach out. I'm sure, like Josh said, we didn't touch on everything, maybe. Um, but yeah, reach out to us for um, questions or episode ideas. We would love to hear from y'all. 
Yeah, I'm about to go all Dave Ramsey on you. <laughs> oh, yeah, <that's, laughs> yeah, that was a better reference. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if you want to reach out to us, you can do so by Facebook. You can send us a message. Of course, our Facebook page is called Snakebird, mm-hmm. or you can send us a direct email at connect at basnakebird.com. And uh, if you do feel like you want to support us financially, then reach out to us and we'll let you know how that's possible. And um, that would be a lot in terms of what we're trying to do. That would mean a lot in terms of us being able to continue this and and reach more. And um, another way that you can support us without uh, any finances is actually giving us a review on Apple Podcasts. That's right. If you can go and you can leave a review, uh, what it does is it helps grow our audience and it helps reach more and let people know that we're out there. So that would mean a lot to us if you could do that. Yeah, that would it really would. Five star review that would that would help push us out there. So it's about the gospel. We we'll always say it. Yes, Amen. So always remember, whatever you do, wherever you go, no matter what life throws at you, there's never been a better time to give to Caesar what is Caesar's. <laughs> and be a snake bird. Snake bird.